Thank you so much for joining us for this online encounter. Whether you're joining us here in Omaha or anywhere around the world, you are part of the Love Church family and we are so grateful that you're here. Make sure that you subscribe and turn on your notifications so that you don't miss a Love Church video. Now grab your Bible and let's get started. You can open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter three. I'm gonna pray for us real quick. 1 Samuel chapter three. Verse one, it says, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare and visions were quite uncommon. Lord, we just pray that today, visions would not be uncommon. Today, we pray, God, that your message would not be rare. God, we pray that you would awaken our hearts, you would open our eyes, you would open our ears, you would awaken our senses to be aware of your presence in this place. God, we didn't come in here for religious duty. We didn't come in here to check the box. Lord, I know that people drag themselves in here today, hoping, hoping that they might taste something real today. God, would you show yourself in great power to all of us, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're taking notes, the title of this message, I'm gonna give you the title of this message, it's How to Hear the Voice of God. Um, my name is Cap Chatfield, by the way, I have the privilege of being a teaching pastor here at Love Church. I'm not the lead pastor. Our lead pastor, uh, Pastor Todd Doxson and Denise, his wife are out of town, they're doing a little sabbatical right now, much needed. I'm really grateful for how they lead, not just in the work that they do, but in showing rhythms of rest and showing it's so important for all of us to, to get away and to get some time with the Lord. And so PT and Denise, just wanted you to know that I honor you. I'm thankful for the opportunity to preach from this stage. Can we just give it up for them and just thank God for their faithfulness? We just pray that you guys are refreshed while you're out. But today, I specifically, I've been praying all week for a word from the Lord, and one thing that I'll say as, like, as a teacher of the word that can be kind of challenging, honestly, is that sometimes it's like the Lord gives you a word, and you're like, man, I, it's, he gave me this word weeks in advance, I know what it is, it's super clear, and then there's other days where he gives you a word, and it's like, I'm like 90% sure this is what you wanna say, and that other 10% kind of haunts you because you're just like, man, I don't want to blow it. And there's also, there's this, there's this scripture that talks about we who teach are going to receive a stricter judgment. And, and so I take what I'm about to say with you, say to you with reverence. And my prayer for you today is if you're in the place of maybe you're just exploring a church for the first time. Maybe you're just kind of getting, you're interested, you're curious, or maybe you're like, I have, I have no desire to be a part of what's going on today. That's okay, like we're glad that you're here. But I would also challenge you to take what I'm about to preach today and teach and verify it. Go grab a Bible, uh, open up uh, the Bible app on your phone and go ahead and like actually hold me accountable to what's being said in the word because what's amazing about what we're gonna talk about today is that the, the voice of God is not reserved for the people on stage. The voice of God is your inheritance. The voice of God, hearing the voice of God in your life is your portion. My question to you is, do you hear his voice? Or do you actually hear his voice? I'm not saying do you come to church and do you hear a pastor's voice. I'm not saying do you listen to Christian podcasts. I'm not saying do you listen to Christian music. I'm not even saying that you go to a small group or even open up your Bible. But when you do any of those activities or anything in between, do you hear the voice of your Father in heaven? I wanna tell you about the first time that I ever heard God's voice. My past is pretty crazy. I grew up in a church, but it was a very traditional church. It wasn't a very spirit-filled church. If I can be honest, it was a church that was very, follow the routines, the religious routines. Check the boxes. Can I get an amen from anybody in here who's come out of religion and has tasted living water by being in the presence of the living God? 
I grew up in religion. I grew up going to church, standing up, sitting down, standing up, sitting down, opening up a hymnal, closing a hymnal, and wearing a polo for crying out loud. Like, I was, for, and if you're wearing a polo in here, no, there's no, no shade on you for that, but I'm a t-shirt and jeans type of guy. I like wearing t-shirt and jeans, but if I wore a t-shirt and jeans to church, I would be hearing about it, or at least be getting some glances from my parents in the pew. Wooden pews, who sits in a wooden pew? I, I don't, sorry, I'm, I'm digressing. But I had, this, I had this upbringing where I grew up in a church where hearing the voice of God like wasn't, it wasn't ever talked about, it wasn't expected, definitely never taught. I remember that I, I was in a, my confirmation class and I was in this Methodist church and we went to confirmation at 13 years old and I remember being at this place where I was actually genuinely curious about the things of God. I wanted to know if there is a God who created everything, who loves me, who has the ability to do supernatural powers and miracles and signs and wonders, I wanna know him. I wanna get to know him. I wanna know what his plan is for my life. And I remember coming to my reverend and I, I, I shared with him, you know what? I wanna read this book. I wanna read this book from beginning to end because if this book is truly authored by God through men, then I believe that this book is gonna teach me about who God is. I'm gonna read the whole thing. And my reverend, like if you can believe this, he said to me, I don't know if you wanna do that. Like this was his job. <laughs> and here he has a, a 13 year old kid who's actually hungry and curious about the things of God. And he's and coming to him saying like, you know what? What I really needed in that moment to be honest Sure, bring it real. Let me know that this book is pretty difficult. There's some things that are, like, are really hard to wrestle through. But don't quench my fire. Get me excited about knowing who God is. Because the reality is, is whether you're 13 years old or you're 83 years old, you open up this book to any page and the Holy Spirit will speak to you. Yes, there's things that are co complex. Yes, there's things that are nuanced and deep and mysterious, but God is not out to be confusing. The Bible says that he is not the author of confusion. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the author of clarity. And he tells us, he says, hey, I want the kids to come to me. The kids carry something that adults kind of lose along the way, and they carry this childlike faith, and they are able to hear the voice of God in a way that is so pure that is something that us adults can really learn from. So I'm in this moment where this, this reverend, and by the way, I've chatted with him, I've actually forgiven him, but I do wanna share this story because this is really what happened in my life. And as you can imagine, this set me on a really poor trajectory when it comes to being a man of God, because I wasn't at all. I was like super lost. Capital L-O-S-T, I was in the muck, I was partying, I was a skater, so I was like all in that world and, and drugs and, and all sorts of stuff. I won't get into like to graphic detail, but it was bad and I was lost. And I remember that there was this one moment in high school, my parents took us on a trip to Latvia. Latvia is a country, it's a country the size of Connecticut on the border of Russia. I have to say that because I say Latvia and people look at me like I'm from a different planet. That's actually where our family's from. We're Latvian, we were going to visit some family members that we'd never met before that didn't even speak our language, which was a trip in and of itself. And so I go on this trip and we're in this hotel. My parents had one hotel room, my sister and I had another. And I was alone for a moment. My sister went to go do something else. I don't know if she went to like go buy something from the store and I was, uh, I had been reading this book for our summer reading. It was a book about the life of, it's called Siddhartha. It was like the life of the Buddha. And it was pretty interesting that they gave us that for high school reading. And it was really interesting that I think about it, that I was actually reading while I was on summer vacation. But here I was in my hotel room actually reading this book. And, uh, and it got me starting to ask these questions about who is God? Is there a God? Are there different gods? Whose religion is right? There's so many different religions. Are they all the same God or are they all different? Is heaven real? Is hell real? I'm starting to think about all these different things. All of a sudden, I'm like thinking about my mortality and what is eternity and all these like super meta thoughts that we try to suppress. If we're completely honest, we try to not think about it. We try to just get through funerals and get on to the next thing and, and just focus on the here and the now. But, we, but there's this thing. The, the Bible says that eternity is written in our hearts. 
So we're actually programmed, DNA, DNA hardwired to, under, to, to at least desire to know what's beyond this. And I'm in this moment and I don't have a relationship with God. I'm super far from God, like an atheist, borderline Satanist, honestly. And I'm, I have this, this thought that goes through my head and the thought was almost like a prayer, almost a prayer, because I wasn't like trying to talk to God, but this is the thought that I had. If God was real, how come we don't see the things that we read about in this book happen in everyday life? How come we don't see healings? How come we don't see the dead raised to life? How come we don't see miracles and signs and wonders and demons cast out of people? How come we don't see that? And in the middle of this thought, I hear the voice of God. And he says to me, because nobody believes me. I was in high school, didn't want God, didn't want the things of God, and he interrupted my own sarcastic, narcissistic, mental rant, and he interrupted me to speak to me and tell me it's because nobody believes me. And you'd think after that moment, I'd turn my life around. I'd start going to church, I'd pick up a Bible, I'd put on my polo, I'd do all the things, right? But for, like, for whatever reason, I get this moment with, the, with God and I just kind of shrug it off and I just keep going on my, my, like just living my life of destruction all the way through college. And what was what's so interesting is as I look back, it's like I didn't really recognize the weight of what happened in that moment until I gave my life to Jesus. And it was in college, it was, it was March 11th, 2013. I was a frat boy going to the University of Miami and I had my fill of everything the world could have to offer. I was partying at all these clubs on South Beach. I was in a fraternity, like I said. I was leading a business. I was like just promiscuous with all sorts of ladies. I was doing drugs three to five times a day. I was drinking all the time. I was in the pit. And I came to this point where someone had shared the gospel with me. And it started, to, it was like a seed that was planted in my heart that started to take root. The gospel, the good news for those who are unfamiliar with that term, the good news that God doesn't require us to climb a mountain to get to him, but God in his infinite love came down to us in the form of Jesus. That's the good news. The good news is that it's not about works to get to know God, it's about rest. It's about resting and receiving the goodness of God, hallelujah. I'm in this moment in my car after he had shared the gospel with me, and it, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me again. And it was almost like he was like, I'm back. <laughs> and this time it was a little bit more severe. He was, he was showing me all of the things that I had just done that weekend, which was a long list, a long list. It's Miami, we, they, we don't sleep in Miami, so it was like lots of activities. He's showing me all these things that I was doing, and he, was, he basically said to me, there's only room on the set of your life for one director, and you're not him. And I want you to give it up. And in this moment of faith, like I literally said, God, Jesus, I don't know who you are, but I got something to tell you. And I just start confessing. I just start confessing the sin from this weekend, which took me a whole car ride. And I'm just confessing all of this sin, and I'm weeping, and I'm just like, just being, I'm like, He's literally delivering me of things. He's pulling things out of my spirit, man, that like I didn't even know were in there. He's like, it was like the most ugly cry ever. Couldn't breathe, couldn't see. I don't know how I got to the parking lot at the gym because my, my, all my vision was just crazy with all the snot and stuff. And so I get to the gym in the parking lot and I just, I have this moment and then it was like, I, I finished confessing and it was like he gave me the words to say and the words were, I will serve you. I will give you my life, I wanna follow you. I didn't even have the grid for that. No one ever taught me that. But he gave me those words to say. And it was in that moment that I was, it was like a peace drum, a peace bomb just like dropped on me. And it was like the, everything that I had been chasing for in the world through drugs, through success, through women, through alcohol, through all of it, everything that I had been chasing for, I finally received in this moment. And I remember he spoke to me in that moment. He said, Cap, I've been waiting for this day for a long time, and I'm so glad that we're here. 
and I don't expect for you to be perfect, but let's just make today day one, and let's go on a walk. And I was like, I can do that. I can handle that. And ever since then, that began my journey, a journey that's not been perfect, a journey that's not, that's bit, at times had really high moments and very low moments, but that began a journey of walking with Jesus and hearing the voice of God that by the grace of God, I haven't departed from. And what I, I wanna share that story with everyone here today is because there are people in our body who believe the lie that to hear the voice of God is not your portion, is not your inheritance. And if you can be completely honest, you've settled with religious duty. You've settled with religious activity, and you said, you know what, I'm just gonna come in, I'm gonna do the thing, I'm gonna check the box. But I, if you're honest with yourself, you've never heard the voice of God in your life, and perhaps it's actually starting to wreak havoc in your life. This is what it says in Proverbs Chapter 29, verse 18, it says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Where there is no ability to hear the voice of God, people live in lawlessness. Come on, somebody. It doesn't take, I, you don't even have to turn on the news to know that we're living in a lawless culture right now. And what's really scary, the world's gonna be the world, right? Like, the, it's People who don't know God are gonna do things in a way that don't follow God. Like, we shouldn't be surprised by that. But what's really alarming to me is that the church seems to be more divided than ever. And, and with these um, like huge topics that are going on around, with like the overturning of Roe v. Wade and uh, you know, gender dysphoria and all these different things, and I'm not here to make a case about any of those things today, but what I would say is God is not confusing about these matters. God is not the author of confusion, but for whatever reason, in the body of Christ at large, it's like this buffet of, of perspectives and opinions, and you can take what you want and leave what you want, and it's like, well, what does God really think about any of this? What does God have to say? Check this out, this is amazing. When we, when we receive the voice of God, when we as believers get to hear the voice of God, two things happen. Number one, we receive direction, from God at a personal level and a corporate level. And number two, we are unified. We're unified when we hear his voice. I'll prove it to you. This is what it says in John chapter 10, verse five. This is Jesus speaking. He said, after he has gathered his own flock, he, he walked ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. He's talking about Jesus being the good shepherd. We are his sheep. I know there's a phrase going around saying like, uh, you know, lions, not sheep. I'm a lion, I'm not a sheep. If you're a person, if you're a child of God, you're a sheep. We're all a sheep here, okay? We're all sheep. We wanna be lions, and yes, you can be given the spirit of God, the power of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yes and amen. But when we forget that we are first sheep and that we will follow somebody's voice, we are instantly vulnerable to follow the wrong voice, we need to humble ourselves and recognize I was not created to lead myself. I was created to be led by my shepherd. And Jesus is my good shepherd. He's talking about he's the shepherd, we are a sheep, and we follow him because we know his voice. We cannot follow him unless we know his voice. We cannot have direction unless we know his voice. He goes on to say, they won't follow a stranger, they will run from him because they don't know his voice. You wanna know how you and I can stay on the straight and narrow and continue to follow God and honor God in these last days, in these crazy times? We need to grow in the ability to be able to hear his voice. Because there's so much calamity and confusion and chaos, but God's voice as a, as a small whisper is still leading his people through this stuff. And he intends to give us clarity and not confusion, so that's direction. But here's what it says about unity. This is so wild. It says, I have other sheep too that are not in the sheepfold. I must bring them also. So what Jesus is saying is, hey, there's people that aren't yet part of the family of God that need to be, that are destined to be, and I'm, I'm trying to bring them to myself. And so I'm crying out, I'm calling for these sheep to come home. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. Oh my goodness, come on somebody. Do you see what I'm saying here? Jesus is saying division is demonic in the church. Sectarianism is demonic in the church. 
Jesus did not come for a fragmented bride. He came for a unified bride, a unified flock. And the only way that you and I will be unified with our brothers and sisters in Omaha, in Nebraska, in the United States, and globally, as far as the body of Christ goes, the only way that we will be unified is by hearing the voice of God. Because then opinion doesn't matter. God doesn't ask my opinion. God doesn't ask about my preference. And praise God that he doesn't. Because his ways are higher than my ways and better than my ways. But until we lay down our pride and say, you know what? No, I, I need a word from the Lord. Until we can get to the place as a body, as, a, as small group leaders, as, as friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, where we're not just counseling out of like, well, here's what I think and here's what I've done. And I'm not saying that there's not a place for that. That's called prophetic counseling if God is actually speaking to you. But the first thing that we should be training each other to do is to say, well, what's God speaking to you about that? What's he saying? Because you have the right to hear God's voice. It even says in Acts chapter two, get this, this is like what we have, oh my goodness, what we have as believers is something that the people of God for generations, for millennia, they were waiting for. They were waiting for the universal privilege for God's people to all hear God's voice because they didn't have that. God would only speak to select people at select times and he would maybe speak to you if the priest, if he gave a word to the priest and the priest gave it to you. And it's like, it, God, Jesus just demolished all of that on the cross for us. He created a way for you and for I, for you and for me, whether you are a, a pro sinner who's just coming into the kingdom or you've been walking with Jesus for 80 years, the voice of God is your portion and quite honestly, that's why we get really weird religions and really weird cults is because people have said, I'm the gatekeeper to the voice of God. You need to come to me for personal revelation. And God's like, no, bump that. I wanna speak to all my people. In Acts chapter two, this is where we see that happen. It says in Acts chapter two, verse 17, you know the story, it's the story of Pentecost. Jesus ascends to heaven. He says, don't leave the upper room until the Holy Spirit comes and baptizes you all. And then that's, that's when things are gonna get crazy. So, and it does, it gets really crazy. The Holy Spirit falls, people start praying, and, uh, praying in tongues and prophesying. And then Peter starts preaching, and this is what Peter says. He says, in the last days, he's referring to the, the book of Joel, actually. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. This is your portion. This is your inheritance, but... Why don't we get to hear the voice of God? Why do some of us who come to church and maybe our hearts are in the right place, why don't we hear God's voice? I'm not a math guy, I'm not a spreadsheet guy, I'm like, I, I love finger painting, I love the creative stuff, arts and crafts, but God, like, speak about speaking, God speaking to us, God spoke to me in a matrix. You ever seen, like, not the matrix, but a matrix? Check this out, check out this matrix God showed me. So here's gonna be the four things. Here's the question I want you to ask yourself. I'm gonna try to get through these as quickly as possible for the sake of time, but the question I want us to leave here today is asking, which box am I in? Which quadrant am I in? Let me break down this matrix for you, okay. So on the x-axis, that's the, the red line at the top. Basically, on the left side, zero desire to please God, all the way to infinity on the right, infinite desire to please God. The y-axis, where it would be at zero, be zero knowledge of God, all the way through infinity, infinite knowledge of God. We know that God is, is infinite, he's boundless, he can't, he can't be fully known, and so thankfully, this is stuff that we get to grow in. But here's, here's the four categories for where we might be in our relation to hearing the voice of God. The first category is called lawless. Someone say lawless. Can you keep that up, please? I wanna keep that up to show people. So in the lawless category, that would basically be little desire to please God, little knowledge of God. This would be people that just don't have any revelation of who God is, nor any desire to follow God. Most of us fall into that category before we come to know Jesus. I especially did. Let's go to the bottom one, bottom left, disobedient. Someone say disobedient. This would be little to zero desire to please God, but tons of knowledge of God. Maybe you've been walking with the Lord for a while, you've begun, you've, you were really close to him in one season, but along the way your heart started to get away from you. You started to get consumed with the cares of this world. 
You started to get consumed with what other people think about you. You just grew lazy. You know a lot about the things of God. You know what his will is. You just have no desire to do it. And we can all fall into any of these categories, by the way. This is not to cast judgment. But let the Lord read our hearts. Let the Holy Spirit reveal to us which one we're in. Top right is immature. Someone say immature. Tons of desire to please God, but little knowledge about God. This is a place where a lot of us come, especially when we, when we begin to follow Jesus. All of this zeal, all of this passion, we know that he's forgiven us of our sins, made us new, given us a brand new life and a brand new calling. But if we're honest, we're like kind of wily and we don't know a lot. And so we can preach a lot of things that are incorrect and have a lot of uh, misunderstandings about who God is. And so it's not a bad place to be, but it is a vulnerable place to be. And we need to grow and get our roots deep in the soil so that we can withstand the, withstand the trials around us and so we can grow and bear fruit, which is the fourth category, faithful. Someone say faithful. Tons of desire to please God, tons of knowledge of God. This is where God wants us to grow. And let me say that fourth category, this is not a place of arrival. This is not a destination to arrive on, especially particularly on this side of heaven. This is something that we're aiming for. And this is something by the grace of God that we can live in. We might slip into any of those three. Hopefully we don't. We wanna keep pressing towards faithful maturity. And what we're gonna read very briefly here is basically about these three different people or four different people and how each of these four different people from this story represent these different things. Let's hop right into it. So the first category is lawless. You can open up your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. It says, now the sons of Eli were scoundrels. Eli, he's a priest in the temple. He's a Levite. He's part of this tribe that God had given an inheritance to, to actually be the priests, and his sons were part of that priesthood. So just to give you context. Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. Whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, Eli's sons would send over a servant with a three-pronged fork. While the meat of the sacrificed animal was still boiling, the servant would stick the fork into the pot and demand that whatever it brought up be given to Eli's sons. All the Israelites who came to worship at Shiloh were treated this way. Sometimes the servant would come even before the animal's fat had been burned on the altar. He would demand raw meat before it had been boiled so that it could be used for roasting. The man offering the sacrifice might reply, take as much as you want, but the fat must be burned first. Then the servant would demand, no, give it to me now or I'll take it by force. These, are, these guys are just corrupted in regards to their duties as priests. They're in it for selfish gain. So the sin of these young men was very serious in the Lord's sight for they treated the Lord's offering with contempt. I wanna talk about the sin of commission. What we're looking at here is the difference between lawlessness and disobedience is that with lawlessness, you're not restrained by any law. You have no revelation of the law. You're just going and doing your own thing. And the Bible is really clear that this path leads to destruction and many are going down that path. We can see it all around us. Some of us have family members and friends that are going down that path of destruction. And this path of lawlessness is not God's design. Here's what's amazing. When we think about law, we think of, well, you're restricting my freedom. You're keeping me from doing what I wanna do. But in God's economy, when God created the entire cosmos, he created the universe, he created it with certain laws of how it's supposed to operate. And so his laws are not to restrict us, but to set us up for success, to set us up for fruitfulness and for flourishing. And there's a lot of people, and there might be even people in this room today or watching online, you know about God to a certain degree, but you haven't submitted yourself to his law. You, there might be people even in this place who are in proximity to the things of God, like Eli's sons, and yet you're living in complete lawlessness. You're coming in, you're, you're putting on like a, your church face, but if you're honest, Monday through Saturday, a lot like me when I was growing up, you live like there's no law at all. You live in lawlessness. You should not be surprised that you don't hear God's voice when you're not listening and, and following his law. We don't follow his law to win his love. We follow his law because he first loved us. And in that relationship, it opens up our ears 
to be able to hear his voice. Here's the simple call to action, which we'll get to in a little bit. The simple call to action for those who are in that place where you're like, you know what? I've been living in lawlessness. I've even been pretending to be a Christian, but I have been truly living as, as though I'm the God of my life. You're walking this direction like I was. You're walking in a direction of, a direction of destruction and sin and hurt and depression, and Jesus says, repent. Repent sounds like a pretty famous, like, you know, fancy religious word. All it means is to simply return. It's to simply say, I'm done living life this way. I'm done living life on my own. I'm turning, I wanna follow the shepherd's voice. I wanna follow his script for my life. If you're in that place of lawlessness, there is so much hope for you if you want this. It's not a 12 step program, it's not going through a Bible class, it's simply turning and saying, Jesus, I will follow you. Maybe you're in that category today, or maybe you're in the disobedient category. You've been following the Lord for a while, but if you're honest, you've just lost the desire to obey his word. This is what it says about Eli in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 22 to 25. It says, now Eli was very old, but he was aware of what his sons were doing. You can underline that. He was aware. It's one thing when the people that you're supposed to be leading are doing things that they shouldn't and you're just not aware of it. It's another thing when you know it and God knows your heart, God knows that you know it. God knows that you're aware and God knows that Eli is aware of what's going on in this scenario. He knew, for instance, that his sons were seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance of the tabernacle. Eli said to them, I've been hearing reports from all the people about the wicked things you're doing. Why do you keep sinning? You must stop, my sons. The reports I hear among the Lord's people are not good. If someone sins against another person, God can mediate for the guilty party. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede? But Eli's sons wouldn't listen to their father, for the Lord was already planning to put them to death. What Eli is guilty of in this moment is not the sin of commission, the sin of actively going and doing evil things, it's the sin of omission. When God tells you to do something and you don't do it, God has given Eli a responsibility, and I talked about this in my last message, Why Men Matter, on Father's Day. You remember that message, I was talking about how we as men, men in this room, men watching online, God has given us a responsibility to lead. Let me say this to fathers in this room. God has given you and I a responsibility not to outsource discipline just to our wives. Discipline should begin with the father, with the head of the home. And I'm not saying this out of personal preference or personal opinion. I'm saying this because this is God's design. This is what God says. And Eli punts on his responsibility, though he's been around the things of God, though he's been faithful as a priest to a certain degree. Because of his disobedience, he needs another person to come to him and give him the word of God. He's completely lost the ability to, to hear the voice of the Lord. And my question to you today is if you're in this place where you're like, man, I wanna get back to hearing the voice of God. Why am I not hearing his voice? Simple question, and this can really change everything for you because this has happened to me many times in my walk with Jesus. The question is, what was the last thing the Holy Spirit spoke to you that you didn't obey? Just ask him. You can even journal that down. What was the last thing, Holy Spirit, that you put on my heart that I didn't obey? For some people in here, the Lord said to you, you need to start tithing, and you've neglected tithing, giving the first and best 10% of your income back to the Lord, not to the church, not to the priests, not to any of that, but to God, as a returning back to God to say, God, I trust that you are my source, you are my source of provision, you are my provider, and I'm grateful so I'm returning this back to you. If God said that to you and you're wondering, why are my finances in disarray? Why am I not hearing the voice of the Lord? The Holy Spirit will gently remind you, hey, remember that thing I told you? If you're obedient to that, we'll clear all this up. For other people in here, you're in a relationship that you know that you're not supposed to be in. Whether it's uh, your boyfriend or girlfriend or a business relationship, and you know the Holy Spirit's been gnawing on your heart, you need to exit out of this relationship. And because you haven't been obedient to that, now you, can, now you don't know which way is up. Now you're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm reaping so much confusion. If you would come back to what Jesus said, what the Holy Spirit said to you originally, and be faithful to it, it'll open up the, the airways for you to hear God's voice. So if that's you in this place and you're walking in disobedience, hey, 
There's grace for you. There's mercy for you. And the Holy Spirit is not gonna confuse you. He's not gonna make you search for something that's not there. If you ask him and he doesn't bring anything up, great. But if, he asks, if you ask him and he reminds you of somebody you need to reconcile with, somebody you need to forgive, something from your, app, from your phone, an app or photos or images or whatever that you need to delete and you haven't done it, do it. Do it. Because when you do, you're opening yourself back up to hear the voice of God. And we can't afford not to hear his voice. The third one, immaturity. First Samuel chapter three, verses three through seven, or one through seven. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare and visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Suddenly, the Lord called out, Samuel, Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. He didn't know God's voice. He thought it was Eli. He thought it was the priest who was calling him. Here I am, did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. Again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. You might be in this place, this is, this is the, that verse I want you to focus on. He had not yet heard the voice of the Lord before. Being in a place of immaturity of hearing God's voice is not something to be ashamed of. It's a place of like, yes, God's got me, he loves me. The only reason you even have a desire to hear his voice is because of his Holy Spirit in you. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing that God wants you to hear his voice more than you wanna hear his voice? And he's given you the power to do it. And here's the three-step process that we look at from Samuel's life in order to hear God's voice. Number one's proximity. Samuel was living in the temple. He was serving in the temple. And some of you have been in this place, you've been serving in Love Kids, you've been serving on other teams, you've been in small groups, you've been coming on Sunday, and you're being faithful to be in proximity. And I'm not here to say stop doing that. I'm I'm here to say lean in. Keep doing those things. Keep being in close proximity. Keep being found in the secret place. Literally go into a room where nobody else is in your your house. Close the door and, and just get alone with Jesus. Proximity is the prerequisite for hearing God's voice. Proximity is number one. Number two is posture. Posture comes down to heart posture. Are we in a place of humility in our hearts where we actually wanna hear what God says? Because we'll see in a second, God will say something to you at times that you don't wanna hear. Do you really wanna hear the voice of God? Even if what he says to you is uncomfortable. But if you and I have a heart posture of humility and faith to say, God, whatever you say, I'm listening. Whatever you wanna tell me, I'm here, I wanna receive it. We were actually backstage before, before we began the, the first worship encounter and one of our guys, Adam, said, if you look in the Bible, if, you're, if you read the Bible, you never see passion unexpressed. So when we talk about lifting our hands and, and raising hands to God and shouting before God and dancing before God, we're just doing what we see in the Bible. And if we live a life before God where our hands are just in our pockets and we're just like, man, I'm just here. Maybe God will show up or maybe not, but I just can't wait for lunch after this. Why should we, why should we expect to receive anything from him? As a father, if my kids came up to me like, yo, dad, what's up? But they didn't have any desire to actually build relationship with me. There's going to be no connection there. Posture, physical posture can look different in different scenarios. Some days it's standing up. In some moments, it's getting on your face or getting on your knees. But whatever the Lord is putting you to do, putting on your heart to do in that moment, be obedient to it. I love seeing OC in the first encounter on his knees before Jesus. We're not doing this out of show. We're doing this out of obedience to what God is calling us to do in that moment. And I'm telling you, there's some people in here, you have heard the voice of God to tell you to get on your knees and pray, to get on your face. And I'm telling you this right now, if you go home and you get alone with Jesus and you just get on your knees as a reflection of what's going on in your heart and you say, Jesus, I wanna hear from you, and you sit and you wait, you will hear from him. 
But how's your posture? Samuel was postured by lying down. Isn't that amazing? Samuel was in a place of rest. You don't need to like do all these theatrics to get God's attention. You've got his full attention. In a place of rest, in a place of lying down, in a place distraction free. If you're lying down, put your phone away, put your iPad away. Even put the book down and just sit down and say, God, I just wanna hear from you. I've had some of my best revelations from the Lord have been just lying down, not saying anything. In fact, there was one time we were in a worship session with the young adults and I was like singing because we were worshiping and I was singing on the ground and the Lord said, stop singing because you're performing for me. I don't want you to perform, I want you to just receive. And as soon as I stopped singing, the Holy Spirit just, just like washed over me, just wrecked me. The peace and power of God just came over me. The third P is practice. Practicing hearing his voice. So we see Samuel's life, he's, he's going back, he's going back, he's going back. He's like, I'm not sure is that God. Is that God? I think it's God. He goes back multiple times and God is pursuing him. The same way God pursued me from when I was uh, in Latvia all the way to when I was in college. He was pursuing me that whole time until the point where I had the ears to hear him. And if you're in this place where you're like, man, I wanna practice this, simple practical tip. Let's make it super practical for you guys. If you have a journal, by the way, we wouldn't have the word of God if it wasn't for men who were faithful to journal what God was saying. Journaling is a spiritual exercise. And when you're opening up the word with God in the morning or at whatever time of day that you do, have a journal next to you and pray and write out what that prayer is. Write it out in clear, co complete sentences. Write out what that prayer is. And then take a moment and just say, Holy Spirit, take my pen and write what you wanna say to me. And you'll just start writing whatever comes to mind. Just write whatever comes to mind. Odds are he's not gonna like clobber you over the head and then you're like, ah, oh, like it's just not gonna happen. He's, he's gentle and he's given us a spirit of self-control. So you'll write and you'll even be asking like, man, I don't even know if this is, what, if this is God. I'm just writing out of faith. I'm writing out of faith. It takes faith. It takes faith. When you write this down, check this out though, you put, you put it down, come back 30 minutes later and read what he said. You will be shocked. You will be blown away because you'll read it and you'll realize, dude, I don't have the capacity <laughs> to say that, nor did I want to say that. That's not what I wanted to hear, but I can trust that is the voice of God. I want you to stand to your feet as we go to the last portion here, faithful. Just gonna read this over us and then we'll pray. It says in 1 Samuel chapter three, verse eight through 20. So the Lord called a third time and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? Then Eli, Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, go and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. And the Lord came and called us before Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel replied, speak, your servant is listening. Faithfulness. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I'm about to do a shocking thing in Israel. I'm gonna carry out all my threats against Israel, against Eli and his family from beginning to end. I have warned him that judgment is coming upon his family forever because his sons are blaspheming God and he hasn't disciplined them. So I have vowed that the sins of Eli and his sons will never be forgiven by sacrifices or offerings. Samuel stayed in bed until morning, then got up and opened the doors of the tabernacle as usual. He was afraid to tell Eli what the Lord had said to him, imaginably so. But Eli called out to him, Samuel, my son, here I am, Samuel replied, faithfulness. What did the Lord say to you? Tell me everything and may God strike you and even kill you if you hide anything from me. So Samuel told Eli everything. He didn't hold back anything. It is the Lord's will, Eli replied. Let him do what he thinks best. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and everything Samuel said provided to be reliable or proved to be reliable. And all Israel from Dan to the north to Beersheba in the south knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. I said this at the beginning, the faithful category, we can live there. It's attainable. We might not get it perfectly, but this is what I believe God is saying of us. 
in the midst of the culture that we live in. We live in a culture of Eli's. We live in a culture of Hophni's and Phineas's, lawless and disobedient generation. We live in an immature spiritual gen generation. And we have people who are crying out like Eli cried out to Samuel, begging for a word from God. And God wants to deliver that word. And he wants to do it through you. He wants to do it through me. Acts chapter two, the spirit of God will be poured out in the last days and my sons and daughters will prophesy, men and women, young and old. They will hear the voice of God. That's what prophecy is, to hear the voice of God and to proclaim it forth, to speak it forth, a word of, of encouragement, a word of exhortation, a word wrapped in love so that people might know that God sees them and has a plan for them. Lord, would you, just, would you just lift out your hands in faith right now? Lord, we just receive this. We receive this. God, would you forgive us when we've been more interested in what Fox News or MSNBC has to say, when we're more interested in what Instagram has to say, when we're more in interested in what Sports Center has to say, then what you have to say, God, we need to hear your voice. Jesus, you said that we live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Father, open up our ears. For those in here who have been lawless, teach them that your law is good and perfect and pure. For those of in here who have been disobedient, God, would you give them an urgency and a desire to obey you at your commands? For all of us who are growing in maturity, God, quicken our maturity, quicken our endurance. Give us a greater desire to pursue you, God, so that we may be found faithful in Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I wanna give this an invitation. I mentioned this about the lawless crowd, a crowd that I knew very well, a crowd that I was a part of, probably the leader of in some regards. And what's amazing about God's law is God's law, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. We look at Jesus and there's this misconception that Jesus came to, to be this nice hippie with feathers in his hair and everyone gets their way and everyone gets the Cadillac and you get a car and you get a car and you get a car and you get prosperity and, and what Jesus came to do was so much different. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law but to fulfill the law. And I came to make a way for you to be transformed, to not walk in death, to not walk in destruction, but to become a new person to be transformed from the inside out. And he made the provision for this because Jesus, when he came from, from heaven to planet earth, he put on skin. The son of God himself became a man like you and I to live a life that you and I were destined to live but never could live. And he lived it to perfection. Fully God, fully man, empowered by the Holy Spirit to model for us, this is your portion. Your portion is to be able to do what I did and even greater things. This is your portion. Not a portion of defeat, not a portion of religiosity, a portion of victory and fulfillment. But the wages of our sin, of our lawlessness is death, separates us from God in this life and the life to come. Heaven and hell are real. Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. Why, because he wanted to judge people and clobber them over the head with truth? No, because he's a shepherd that wants to rescue his sheep. He wants to call us back. He wants to save us from our destructive ways. He died for you and I. He lived the life we could never live and then died a death that you and I deserved in our place on that cross. He was buried in a tomb and then three days later by the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, this trips me out. The Bible says he raised himself from the grave. If God himself can raise himself from the grave, how much more can God redeem your life? How much more can God transform you? How much more can God take you from death 
to his marvelous life. He cracks that grave and he, he extends an invitation to you and to me. Maybe you've been walking through the wilderness like I was at, university to, at the University of Miami. And you come to this place where you're like, I have nothing to give this God. I want to know him. I need to be forgiven. I want to be cleansed. I want the shame to be taken off of me. I want the anxiety and the fear to be taken off of me. I don't want this. I don't believe this is my portion. And so God, I will give you my life. That's all that he asks for and that's everything that he asks for is your life, not your church attendance, not your Bible reading, checks, your life. If that's you, I wanna lead you in a simple prayer. Very simple. As the band is playing, I'm gonna invite you to come forward and stand up here. I'm gonna lead you in a very, very simple prayer. It's an invitation. You'll confess to the Lord something very similar to what I confessed to the Lord in my car on March 11th, 2013. You'll say, Jesus, I recognize I need a savior. I, I recognize that I've been walking in disobedience. I recognize I've been walking in lawlessness and it's not working. And I want your way. I want to follow you. I want to hear your voice. I'm responding to your voice today. Forgive me and wash me clean. And in a moment, you can receive everything that you've been searching for. So while the band is playing, if that's you, I want you to come forward. I'll lead you in this simple prayer. Church, please pray. For those who have the gift of praying in the spirit, of praying in tongues, please pray in the spirit. When you pray in the spirit, you pray the perfect will of God. Pray to yourself before the Lord. We believe God is moving right now. God is calling people home. And the enemy wants to whisper another voice in their ears. Come on, man. Yeah, lead, I love it. Come on, man. Anybody else? We'll let the band play. If that's you, come forward. for a touch from God. If there's anybody in this place that's just, that knows that this word is for them. If maybe there's someone in this room who you've been walking with God, and if you're honest, you're ashamed to admit that maybe you've drifted away, receive. Come here and receive. There's no shame in the house of God. We got your back, we're for you. But you can only be healed as much as you're willing to be known. If there's anybody that wants to just get this fresh touch, to get their ears opened up again to hear God's voice, come forward. We won't sing anymore. If there's anybody else, please come forward. Come on, man. Yeah, bro, come on, dude. Let's go, buddy. Love you, man. My Miami brother, the you, baby. <laughs> How about that? Come on, man. All right, gentlemen, I'm gonna lead you guys in a simple prayer, okay? Hey, I'm, I gotta preface this. This isn't, a, this isn't a magic spell. This ain't no abracadabra. This is words that I'm lending to you. God knows your heart. If you're praying this from a pure heart, God will hear you, okay? But we're not, this is a holy, sacred moment. Let's not just go through this moment repeating things mindlessly. God is so pleased in your step of faith. He intends for you to hear his voice moving forward. Church, if you wouldn't mind raising hands towards these men. Man, there's just an anointing on the men in this church. I just see God raising up men, leaders. And Lord, I'm just grateful. Repeat after me, please. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that by your stripes, I'm healed. 
by the blood of Jesus, I'm forgiven for my sin. Wash me clean. I'm deciding today to follow your voice. I believe in the resurrection. And by the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, fill me with your spirit. Empower me, change me, transform me, lead me to live a life that honors you and blesses a ton of people. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Come on, man. Bless you, bro. Thank you again for checking out this video. If you want to stay up to date on what's happening here at Love Church, please subscribe to this channel and download the Love Church app. Have a great rest of your day as you continue to experience God's best for your life.